So hello everyone, uh, my name is Julie Ferguson and I am at the University of California, Irvine in Southern California. And I'm delighted to be with you today to talk about a topic related to Unit 9 of your AP Environmental Science class, all about global change. And this was a challenge for me because there's so many really interesting topics that I could have chosen from. And I narrowed it down uh, because I'd like to talk with you today about climate change and extreme weather something that is really going to affect all of us, either personally, if you've experienced or might experience an event like this in the future, or just more broadly as a society, because we're going to have to deal with the costs of these events. So firstly, before I get started, I wanted to share a little bit of information about me. So uh, as you can tell from my accent, I am originally from the UK, but I moved to California in 2008 to work at the Department of Earth System Science at the University of California, Irvine. And this was after my PhD, uh, and I came here to do more research on paleoclimate, because my research is all about developing records of past climate change. And I do that by using uh, tiny plankton shells that we find in deep sea sediment cores, or by using the chemical composition of things like mollusk shells that you'd find at the beach, or also tropical corals as well. And we use that information to test how good our climate models are and sort of increase our reliability that they're giving us good information. Now I tend to do more teaching, and so I teach a lot of introductory environmental science classes, uh, including to our uh, majors in our BS in Earth System Science, which is all about the science of global change uh, and what we can do. And then also our new degree, our BA in Environmental Science and Policy, which covers both the environmental science, but also the socioeconomics, the policy, the law, all about uh, the environment. So we're going to be talking about climate change today, but just one small aspect, which is how it affects extreme weather. And so before I talk about that more specifically, I wanted to make sure that you understand that there are certain things about climate change that all of our climate scientists agree on. The first is that our climate is changing and changing really quickly, especially compared to the climate that we've had over the past 10,000 years or more. And really the reason that we're seeing that rapid change is because we have increasing amounts of greenhouse gases such as carbon dioxide and methane in our atmosphere. We know that there are lots of reasons why our climate can change on different timescales over Earth history, but really we know pretty certainly uh, that uh, it's the greenhouse gases that are causing the change we see today. And so why is it we see these increasing greenhouse gases? Well, you've probably learned this in your AP Environmental Science class, that human activities, for example, burning fossil fuels for transportation or to generate electricity, is releasing carbon dioxide to the atmosphere but also deforestation, especially the, the deforestation happening in our tropical forests, is also returning carbon back to the atmosphere as well. And so these are the activities that are really responsible for the change. And what that means is that going forward, if we look at the future climate changes that are coming, really how much change we're going to see depends on what we as a society decide to do. Do we switch to renewable energy? Do we prevent deforestation? that is going to have a really big impact on the scale of the change uh, and the speed of the change that we see in the coming decades and centuries. So today I'm going to talk to you about extreme weather and how it links to climate. And so I wanted to make sure that we're really certain about the difference between weather and climate, because journalists get this wrong all the time. There's lots of news headlines about this, or this heat wave or this drought being climate change. And it's actually a bit more complicated than that. So when I talk about weather, I mean the condition of the atmosphere over a short period of time. It might be a few days or so, it might be just an hour. So an example of, of this might be a hurricane, for example, or a heat wave, that is a weather event. When we talk about climate, we're instead talking about long-term sort of 30 year averages of our climate. And so for example, we have warmer conditions over the last 30 years than the preceding 30 years. That would be about climate change. And this makes it difficult when we think about extreme weather, because 
we can't point at any one hurricane or any one wildfire or heat wave and say that that event was caused by climate change. It may have happened anyway. But what we can say with increasing levels of certainty is that climate change makes these extreme weather events more intense. So it makes them more extreme. That hurricane is more strong. That heat wave is hotter than it was before. And in some cases, it also may make them more frequent. And so we're going to look at a couple of examples today and think about why it is that climate change may make that happen. So why should you care about this? because these events are incredibly damaging to the people that experience them, but also incredibly damaging to our economy as a country as well. So this is a great diagram that we've taken from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration website, and it shows all of the weather events in 2020 that cost more than $1 billion in terms of the damage. And you can see that there's really interesting patterns in terms of the type of extreme event that you get in different places. So over on the West Coast, the big extreme events that we saw in 2020 were related to wildfire. And many of you who live in this region may have experienced the effects of that. If we come towards the middle of the country, we have a drought uh, in the summer months there. And then later on in the year, we also saw more flooding uh, and these uh, extreme thunderstorm events. Also, we had tornadoes. And then the other event that we're going to talk about today is uh, mainly experienced by people in the southwest of the US, but also sometimes Hawaii, and that is hurricanes. You can see that there were quite a large number of hurricanes that made landfall that hit the US mainland last year. And so we want to think about how is climate change going to affect these events? Uh, and that helps us come up with a plan to actually do something about it and protect people from the harm that that may cause. So to begin with, we're gonna start off on the West Coast. I'm gonna take an example from the West Coast and wildfires, and then we're going to look at the East Coast and think about hurricanes. So first of all, it's important to mention that wildfires are a natural part of many ecosystems, especially in the Western US. And they can actually have a lot of beneficial effects in terms of recycling nutrients. A lot of our ecosystems de uh, depend on, say, fire, clearing the forest floor, allowing seeds and new trees to, to uh, grow. But wildfires can also cause death. It can damage human property, as well as causing quite widespread uh, harmful air pollution. And it can cost billions of dollars, both in terms of the damage, but also in fighting these fires as well and helping to protect people. And what we've seen is that there, there seems to be a trend in that recent fires are hotter, so they're burning hotter, they're burning the tops of the trees as well as just the forest floor. They're larger, so they're burning a, a greater area, and they seem to be occurring more frequently and over more months of the year. It used to be fire season was between a particular time of year, and that is sort of getting longer and longer at each end. And there are lots of really complex factors that go into wildfires. So it can be that there's many causes behind some of these trends that we're seeing. Uh, so first of all, we're just seeing increased human development at we, what we call this wildland interface. So there are more people close to where uh, the forests are. We also, in the 1900s and, and sort of that century, saw fire suppression. So especially in places where we were using uh, forests for timber, we saw fire as a bad thing and we just put out all of the fires as soon as they occurred. And what that did was it allowed fuel to build up on the forest floor. Usually these smaller fires would come through and clear out that material on the, the forest floor. But when that didn't happen, when we put out all of the fires, that built up over time. And now when fires do occur, there's lots of fuel there to burn. And that tends to make these fires more intense. It burns hotter and it tends to help that fire reach the canopy rather than just move along the floor, it tends to kill more trees. And then lastly, of course, we have climate change playing into this as well. And so in this particular uh, lecture, I want to talk more about what it is uh, related to climate change that could cause these wildfires to get worse. So this is my framework for thinking about the impacts of climate change on wildfire. And so you can see that it's pretty complicated, so we're gonna go a step by step. So first of all, if we start at the very top, you can see that we have increasing temperatures. 
We have more greenhouse gases in our atmosphere that's trapping more of that outgoing infrared radiation and so that warms up our air temperatures. And that has a number of different effects that you can see here. The first is simply that we see increased evapotranspiration. That means we have more water being lost from the leaves of plants uh, as they're photosynthesizing. Uh, we also see more evaporation from the soil. It just means that the area ends up being drier overall because of these hotter temperatures and more evaporation. The second one you can see in the middle here is less precipitation. And I've put a question mark here because we have a great deal less certainty when we talk about precipitation patterns and what's going to happen in the future. It's something that it's really difficult to get right in our climate models. But what we do seem to be seeing is that wet areas are getting wetter and dry areas are getting drier. So what that means is that we seem to be seeing more flooding in certain places, more drought in others. And in the Western US, that seems to be leading uh, to less precipitation and more periods of drought. Uh, that, of course, means that you end up with drier vegetation again because there's less rain, there's less water available. The other thing that's really important in the Western US is the importance of snowpack. So a lot of our rain in the Western US falls in the winter, or a lot of our precipitation. And because it's falling in the winter and we have nice big mountains, a lot of that precipitation actually falls as snow. And that means that instead of entering streams and running straight back to the ocean, it collects and it builds up over the winter. It basically acts like a natural reservoir storing that water uh, for both the ecosystems and also humans, because then as it melts away over spring and summer, we have this source of water during the dry months that provides water to our trees and other vegetation. But as we have increasing temperatures, what we're seeing is that there's less and less snow and more and more rain in the winter. So we're not storing as much snow to begin with and it's melting away sooner, which means that we have these later summer months where we really don't have that water source that we used to have. And again, that can go into drying out our vegetation. And the drier our vegetation is, it's easier for it to catch fire. And when it does catch fire, it can spread more easily. It burns uh, more intensely. So we get these worse fires. The last thing on my diagram that I wanted to mention is actually based on some research that was done in our department, which was looking at where fires seem to be happening where they weren't before and what was causing it. And in particular, we're seeing this increase in uh, parts uh, of in forests within Alaska and parts of Canada that we hadn't seen before and are quite a long way from humans. And what we seem to think is that these increasing temperatures are increasing the likelihood that we have big storms. And so we get more lightning strikes in places that we didn't actually see before. And so we're seeing this move north of these large fires, uh, burning places that we didn't usually have fires before and even into the Arctic, uh, which is pretty much unheard of. And so what the research tells us, there's a really interesting research study done in 2016 was uh, looking at uh, what would have happened without climate change and what happened with climate change. And what they came up with was that the area burned between 1984 and 2015 in the Western US is about twice what it would have been without climate change. And so climate change isn't a small factor here, it's actually a really significant factor in this sort of area burned uh, because of all of these different impacts. So why is it we should care about this? Why should we be concerned about wildfire? So what harm does it cause? So I have three images here to try and represent that. So in the top image here, you're looking at uh, the remains of uh, an area of a town that burned uh, in the Al Alameda fire in Oregon. And you can see that it was really devastating. People lost their homes uh, and these fires, especially when they're really fast moving, can cause deaths and injuries there just isn't much time, uh, let alone the trauma of having to live through a really scary event like this. It is not very fun. Um, so it destroys homes, infrastructure, property, uh, and also has effects on the timber industry, agriculture, tourism, for example, if you have to close areas like Yosemite, for example, after fires. Uh, in the bottom left hand side, this image is actually from San Francisco during the 2020 fires. If you were on the West Coast, you may have experienced several days like this 
back in fall. I know we did here in Southern California as well, where the, the sky was completely orange. It looked very apocalyptic. Uh, and that's because of the particles, the smoke produced by these wildfires. And that affects air quality. In particular, the particulate matter You've got these tiny particles that when you breathe in gets into your lungs and can uh, cause damage. But the other thing, of course, is that we're returning a lot of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere during these fires, and that can amplify global warming. So it's one of these positive feedback loops. It's amplifying climate change. And then on the right hand side, you can see these other longer term effects. So we're seeing destruction of ecosystems and habitat. And especially where we're seeing these, fire, these fires happen more and more frequently, we can actually see long term changes in the type of vegetation that is growing in these places. It also makes it easier for invasive species to come uh, and colonize an area as well. It can lower water quality, and that's because we're losing the root systems and the vegetation that helps bind the soil together. And so we get more and more erosion when we get rainfall and that gets down into our streams and our rivers. Also, the chemicals used for fighting the fires as well can get down and into those streams and harm aquatic ecosystems. And then lastly, something that happens a lot around the Los Angeles area is that when we get these big uh, wildfires, it again removes this vegetation, removes the, the root systems holding the soil together. Also, where we get these really hot fires, we get this chemical on the, the surface of the soil that prevents water seeping in. And so when we do get our winter storms the following winter, we get uh, more frequent flooding because that water doesn't seep down as much. It runs across the surface. Uh, and that also increases the risk of landslides as well. So there's lots of associated hazards with this, apart from just the fire itself. So the question is, what do we do about it? Because one of the main reasons that we study these things is because we want to better understand and try and mitigate the risk, reduce the risk to people and ecosystems. So the first thing we can do is try and prevent as many fires from starting. Uh, actually, more than 80% of the fires in the US are actually created and started by humans. So the rest are often caused by uh, lightning strikes, uh, for example, in those northern forests. But especially where we have people close to the forests, a lot of them are started by people. Uh, and that can be an accident. It can be someone with a campfire getting out of hand, uh, or it can be arson sometimes. And a couple of the big fires we've seen recently in California have been uh, the, the cause of them has been ascribed to uh, problems with the electricity grid. The idea that we have these big transmission lines and when it's windy or if there's a, a fault, it can create a spark which can trigger a wildfire. And so one of the things that we're doing now in, in Southern California is there's actually ways that you can shut down parts of the transmission system. So if you know that there's going to be a really strong wind event, then you actually shut down parts of the, the energy transmission system to try and prevent any uh, chance of uh, a wildfire happening. Obviously, that causes other problems because it means that uh, some areas might not have electricity for a while, but that is one way of dealing with this. The next thing we can do is we can try and manage our forests a little better. We said that fire suppression caused this material to build up. Well, what we can do is we could try and have these controlled burns to clear out some of that vegetation when the weather conditions are suitable so we wouldn't uh, get out of control. So we could definitely manage our forests in a different way uh, to help us reduce the intensity of fires when they do happen. The next thing we can do is simply find ways of preventing deaths and protecting structures during fires. We sort of know they're going to happen. So what is it we can do to help? So the first would be let, let's educate people. Let's come up with plans so that we have evacuation routes. People know what to do. There are warning systems that make sure that everyone hears about a, a fire when it happens and can get out. And then also with structures, well, maybe we can think about the design of our buildings, what they're made from, the building materials. We need to try and make sure that everyone understands to have a defensible space. So an area around your home where you've cleared the trees away, you've removed anything that might be flammable like gas tanks. And then lastly, we just need to plan better. So uh, can we regulate where buildings are happening? Uh, can we uh, educate people? Can we restrict, for example, where people can uh, have campfires, what activities people are carrying out? So all of these ways are great ways and you can no doubt think of many, many more. All right, so with that, 
I want to switch to the East Coast and think about climate change and hurricanes. So here you can see a large hurricane approaching uh, the coast of the US, uh, Louisiana here. So hurricanes are also known as cyclones or typhoons, depending where in the world they are, but they're all the same thing. There are these huge storms that develop specifically over tropical oceans because they need warm water to form. The number of them varies a lot from year to year, and that makes it quite difficult for us to see a trend over time uh, in terms of the number of hurricanes that are happening. What we're seeing is that more and more people are living near the coast. And so even if climate change wasn't affecting the strength of hurricanes, there are about three times as many people now near the coast that can be influenced and affected by the damage that hurricanes can cause. So if we look at the research that's been done, we really can't say right now whether climate change is going to increase the number of hurricanes or decrease or stay the same. The research just isn't certain enough for that. So we don't know that yet. But what we do know is that hurricanes are very likely to get stronger due to climate change. And in fact, we think we're already seeing that. We seem to be seeing uh, more of the category three, four and five hurricanes, those strongest hurricanes, compared to the category one and two hurricanes, these weaker hurricanes. So one of the things that I want to do before we talk about climate change and, and uh, how hurricanes form is talk about why hurricanes cause damage. What are the ways that they can affect uh, society and people and ecosystems? Well, the first image in my top left is meant to show the damage that being, can be caused by strong winds. So we're getting better and better at building our uh, houses and our infrastructure in a way that can withstand strong winds. But these hurricane winds can be extremely strong and the stronger they are, the more damage they cause. For example, they can cause trees uh, to fall down onto buildings or across roads. It can also bring down, for example, our electricity transmission lines and, and cause power to be lost. The top right diagram shows uh, flooding. And this is something that is very, very common and incredibly damaging after our hurricanes, often one of the, the main sources uh, of economic damage. And that's because there is so much rain that falls uh, over these areas that it just overpowers the ability of the natural stream channels to carry that water back to the ocean. And so it spills out and spreads across the landscape. And then lastly, at the bottom, my two diagrams here are meant to represent storm surge. And storm surge tends to be what causes most of the deaths and a lot of the damage along coastlines specifically as a result of hurricanes. So what is a storm surge? Why should you be worried about that? Well, the idea is that these hurricanes are associated with really strong winds and those winds push water up towards the coastline as that hurricane moves towards the coast, it pushes water ahead of it. And that ends up raising the level of the ocean. So in my right hand diagram at the bottom here, you can see the bottom line here represents the mean sea level. This is the average sea level over time. Uh, the arrow above that shows the high tide. So you have to be lucky and hope that your storm surge doesn't uh, get associated with that extra amount of high tide. And then above that, you can see that the level of the, the ocean has risen way above. And that storm surge for weaker hurricanes can be maybe just a foot or something that wouldn't be noticeable. But in really large, powerful hurricanes, it can be maybe 20, 30 feet. Uh, and that can be really devastating because the whole ocean rises over many hours to be much higher than usual. That allows that water to flood inland. It can affect uh, homes. And then on top of that, you have waves crashing. And so if you have a home near the beach, uh, it's very, very hard for that home to withstand that. That building tends to be uh, very, very damaged. And you can see some of the effects of a storm surge uh, from an area of Florida uh, in this image on the left hand side. So really, really devastating and one of the main ways that we get uh, damage in these hurricanes. So I wanted to talk a little bit about how hurricanes form. What are the ingredients you need to form a hurricane? Because we need to understand that before we can understand why climate change might make them stronger. So here is my diagram that I tried to draw out, like a little cartoon to show a hurricane. So you can see that we're over the ocean water and I've taken a slice down through the hurricane. Usually you're seeing satellite images looking for above and it's sort of this big spiral. 
we're taking a slice down through it. And you can see that that hurricane consists of a set of these thunderstorms that are circulating around this central low pressure system. And in particular, those uh, storm clouds get stronger and stronger into the middle. And, and uh, these uh, really tall clouds here on either side of that central eye, the eye of the hurricane, the, the walls on either side are called the eye wall. Uh, and this is where the most damaging hurricane conditions tend to happen as the hurricane moves across. So let's look at my labels here to try and understand how our hurricane forms. So the first thing that we need in order to form a hurricane is warm water, and by warm water I mean really warm, greater than 80 degrees Fahrenheit, which is about 26 degrees Celsius. So that's why these really only form in the tropics. We then have warm air above the ocean and we get evaporation of that lovely warm ocean water into the air, so we end up with lots of water vapour contained within our warm air. Because we have this central low pressure system, this is our centre of the storm, we have air moving from high pressure to low pressure, so that air tends to converge into the middle of the storm. It spirals inwards because it's affected by the Coriolis force as well, so it spirals inwards to the middle. And because it's all moving inwards, once it gets to the middle, there's nowhere really for it to go other than up. So it's forced upwards, and you can see it spirals upwards uh, with most of that air rising within the eye walls on either side of the eye. So as that air rises, something really interesting happens, which is that air cools down and all of the water vapour, that, that uh, gaseous form of the water within the air, condenses out. And this is where we, uh, we manage to fuel our hurricanes. So let me take a step back for a second and remind you that one of the reasons that we sweat is that that helps cool us down. So we produce little droplets of sweat on our skin and as that water from the sweat evaporates, that helps cool us down. That's because it takes energy away from our skin. This is called a latent heat flux, uh, this uh, amount of energy that's required by water in order to evaporate. But here's the key thing. When that water condenses again, when it goes back from gas to liquid, that same amount of energy that was carried away during evaporation gets released back. So this condensation process releases heat to the surrounding air and that surrounding air warms up. And what does warm air do? It rises. And so as this moisture condenses, we get this warming of the air which causes it to rise even further. And because it's that air is rising even further, that pulls more air in from underneath. And so what we do is we create this, this sort of uh, everlasting uh, loop where we have air converging and rising, but then it's forced to rise even more because it's being heated and that pulls more air from underneath. So it's self-sustaining, this storm. By the way, this is why these hurricanes tend to die away when you move on to land. Because once you're on land, you no longer have lots of evaporation. You cut off your source of moisture so we don't get as much condensation and so the storm just starts to fade away. We can't fuel that storm anymore. So it's really this condensation process that keeps that storm going and strengthens it over time. And then there's one last thing on my diagram that I wanted to mention, and it's over here on the left hand side, this big red arrow with a cross through it. And what that is meant to show you is weak upper level winds. Um, so uh, the other thing we need for these hurricanes to form is something we call low amounts of wind shear which is low amounts of wind in the upper atmosphere. And that's because what we want to do if we want a hurricane is we want to have all of that air rising in one central place. And if we have strong upper level winds, it basically blows the hurricane apart. Instead, that rising air is spread over a larger area and we do get that condensation, but it's not in one central place near the eye, it's spread over a large plain area and it weakens the hurricane. So those are the things we need for our hurricanes to form. So the question you are hopefully asking is, well, how is climate change going to affect the strength of these hurricanes? What particular aspects of the way that our climate is changing cause that to happen? So here is my diagram uh, trying to show those different features. So the first thing I want to draw your attention to is our surface ocean. And I've drawn a red box here to, to try and show that our surface ocean is getting warmer a huge amount of the energy, about 90% of that extra energy that has been trapped on Earth due to those greenhouse gases, 
has actually gone into warming up the oceans. So our surface ocean has been getting warmer and that makes it easier to evaporate. We also get warmer air above the ocean that can hold more water vapor. So we have more moisture in the air. We then have that air converging and rising and because there's more moisture, that means that we have more condensation. And because we have more condensation, that means we get more rain. So that strengthens the amount of rain we get and worsens flooding. It also increases the amount of heat that is released and causes more air to rise and even more air to come in. So that strengthens the winds because we get this uh, stronger rising air pulling in more winds from underneath. And so we get this increase in rainfall, increase in, in strong winds. And then the last thing that could cause damage was our storm surge. So if we're getting stronger winds, that's going to push more water. So that's automatically going to worsen our storm surge. But the other thing we have to worry about is that our sea level is also rising. So our mean sea level is getting higher. And so not only is the storm surge bigger, but it's also going to be higher already because of higher sea level. So why is it that our sea levels are rising? There's two main reasons. The first is simply to do with the fact that it's warming up. As uh, something warms up, the molecules move faster. And in the ocean, those molecules uh, moving faster, they spread further apart. Uh, and so what that does is that if you get four kilometers of ocean all spreading apart, that creates a measurable increase in sea level. That's something we call thermal expansion, the fact that it's warming up and that water expands. The other reason, of course, is that we're seeing melting of ice in our glaciers uh, on Greenland and Antarctica, and that puts more water into the ocean and raises the level. So that again worsens our storm surge. The last thing I want to point out is again related to this wind shear, these upper level winds. And I've put a question mark there because one of the reasons that we actually uh, aren't sure what's going to happen to the number of hurricanes is because we think that this wind shear might get stronger in the future. And that might mean that we uh, see fewer hurricanes, but it's really uncertain. So we just don't really know what's going to happen there. So as we said before, if we know it's going to happen, we can do something about it. Our understanding of the scientific processes here and what impacts it has means that we have an opportunity to try and prevent as much damage as possible. So there are lots and lots of things you could do here. I'm just giving you a, a few examples of things that we could uh, try. So the first one is that if we know that sea levels are rising and that we have these storm surges, can we build seawalls to protect our uh, built environment? And can we also make sure that we're preserving our natural defenses against storm surge? Many of you might have learned about ecosystem services. Well, natural defenses against storm surge is one of these ecosystem services, something that we get as a benefit from the natural ecosystems that exist. And in particular, along many of the, the areas that are affected by hurricanes, we get these amazing mangrove swamps uh, and also mangrove uh, forests, and also we get coral reefs. Both of those are really good at reducing uh, the strength of the waves, uh, reducing coastal erosion, uh, and they're good protection against storm surge. Here you can see that we don't also have to rely on just concrete to build out our seawalls. We can also do things like have these bamboo walls to try and, and slow down uh, the, the waves and protect against coastal erosion. The next thing is, well, if we know that sea levels are rising, if we know that, uh, that we're going to have stronger hurricanes in future, which are gonna cause more flooding, well, maybe we need to sort of draw a line and say, you can't build in these places. It's not responsible for our government to let people develop in certain places. And if there are people living in really vulnerable places, maybe we also need to help them relocate as well. And then if we have infrastructure like roads or uh, electricity stations or water systems that are vulnerable, we need to also either relocate them or protect them as well. And that's related to storm surge near the coast, but also flooding as well. Uh, the next thing we can do is try and reduce urban runoff. So where we have lots and lots of rain, that can be made worse by our urban environment. And that's because if we think about most cities, what we imagine is lots of concrete everywhere. And that concrete acts as what we call an impermeable surface. Uh, when rain falls, that rain can't get through the concrete. It collects on the surface and therefore runs off more quickly into our streams. So even just with normal rainstorms, our urban areas tend to be 
more at risk from flooding. If we then add in hurricane strength rainfall, then we're going to be in trouble. And to be honest, there's a certain amount that we can't really do uh, for, for the amount of rainfall that we're going to get with hurricanes. Uh, if we look at, for example, at Hurricane Harvey um, that hit uh, Texas, there was, I think, 60 inches of rain, which is a ridiculous amount of rain. And it's going to be very difficult uh, to protect against that sort of rainfall. And that is going to become more frequent uh, as we get uh, this more moisture in the air, more condensation, uh, more rainfall as well. So that's something that we need to bear in mind when we're building our environments, when we're dealing with our urban areas. And then lastly, uh, we can uh, think about encouraging policies uh, to build resilience. So we need to preserve, for example, wetlands and floodplains further back in our drainage basin or our watershed, because that also helps slow down uh, the flow of water. We can educate people about the danger of hurricanes. We can help them prepare their own homes. We can help them uh, come up with evacuation plans for where they're going to go. Uh, the government also provides uh, national flood insurance, for example, which is actually required for people living in certain areas that are commonly flooded. And then cities as well can plan. How is it that we are going to help people deal with the effects of these stronger hurricanes in the future, uh, especially more vulnerable people? And this brings me on to one uh, last thing I want to say about extreme events specifically, which is how it relates to environmental justice. So when we look at the effects of natural disasters, we see that people in poverty and marginalized groups are disproportionately impacted by these events. And there's a number of reasons for that. If you want to read more, I have a, a file, a link down here, which has a, a report explaining some of these things. But here are just some of the reasons why that may be true. Uh, firstly, they may be less likely to receive warnings, and even if they do receive warnings, they may be less likely to evacuate or less likely to avoid the hazard. So we saw that, for example, with Hurricane Katrina, which is uh, people who could evacuate did, but maybe people didn't have a car and so weren't able to evacuate. Or maybe you don't have the resources to go and stay in a hotel for a week uh, to avoid something like that. Maybe they just can't. The other example I have is down here in the bottom right hand corner. This is something we see uh, every year with climate, uh, with wildfires in the Western US, which is that uh, one of the things you're recommended to do when we have these really bad smoky days is stay inside and avoid being outside in that smoky air. But if your job depends on you being outside, for example, our farm workers here, then you don't have that choice. And so you're more likely to be exposed to this hazardous air quality. The next uh, list thing on my list is that uh, poorer people um, are unfortunately a greater chance of living in vulnerable housing uh, that could be more affected by, for example, strong winds uh, and in at-risk zones. If you live in a flood zone, if you have a choice and you can afford it, often you will move to somewhere that's less at risk. And that tends to leave behind the people that can't afford to move somewhere else or it devalues your property price and so uh, that means that it's hard uh, to, to move away. They also tend to have less access to healthcare, um, less wealth to recover after a disaster. So if uh, there's a big disaster and you don't have a lot of savings, it's difficult to repair your home, uh, to uh, repair your business, for example. And then also we tend to see that uh, these marginalized groups tend to have less political power to advocate for themselves, to advocate for help either before or after one of these events. Uh, and uh, an example of this uh, is uh, shown in the upper image here. So this image shows uh, an area of Puerto Rico about six months after Hurricane Maria and Hurricane Irma struck. And you can see that the blue that you see there on the roofs is actually tarpaulins where people's roofs have been damaged and they still haven't been fixed six months after an event. And there is concern that uh, it, depending on where you are and your political power, there may be different amounts of resources provided uh, to your region to help uh, you recover after such an, an event. And so given that we are seeing this increased probability of natural disasters related to climate change, uh, and we need to adapt and limit the risk and damage to people, that actually gives us a, an opportunity to be more proactive and actually address some of these equity issues uh, and try and ensure environmental justice where we can, where we have new policies. 
So I wanted to end on a happier note because talking about climate change can be pretty depressing and pretty overwhelming. It just seems such a huge problem. And so I wanted to share an image with you that I use a lot in my college classes to try and give people a framework for thinking about action. Because really the best thing that we can do to try and reduce the risk of these uh, really devastating events is act to prevent as much climate change as we can. That's going to reduce the risk of these extreme events. And so this is a complicated diagram, so let me walk you through it piece by piece. So first of all, we're going to look at the black writing and the black arrows, and we're going to start at the very top at 12 o'clock. So we can all agree that most of us have a desire for improved well-being, for better lives. And what that tends to, to do is create a demand for goods and services. Maybe we want better food, maybe we want to travel, maybe we want a new TV. Um, and so that demand for goods and services, in turn, creates a demand for cheap, easy energy. Um, and in turn, right now, the way that we produce that cheap, easy energy is using fossil fuels. They are a great source of cheap, easy energy. But the problem is, is that burning those fossil fuels produces CO2 emissions that enter our atmosphere. So we're causing an increase in the CO2 in our atmosphere. And in turn, that extra CO2 is causing a more warming of our climate, it's causing our climate to change, and it's also having negative impact on our oceans, for example, through ocean acidification, which is a huge uh, potential problem. And these negative impacts on our climate and our ocean and our ecosystems end up reducing our well-being. They harm us, but we want better lives. And so you can see that this cycle just keeps going. And so the good news is, is that there's lots of places where actually we can act to prevent this cycle, to prevent climate change and try and prevent a harm to people's lives. So let's take a look at those actions and each of them is in red and marked by this sort of red line showing a break in the cycle. So first of all, we have a desire for improved well-being. Well, does, does that necessarily translate into more stuff? Uh, can we think about uh, encouraging people to think differently about diet? Do we get rid of, say, uh, single-use plastic items or plastic packaging? So can we uh, somehow remove uh, the demand for goods and services or reduce the extra demand for goods and services associated with people's lives getting better? So that would be a conservation. We're still going to have some demand for goods and services, though. We're not going to stop going anywhere or not use uh, appliances. And so can we actually produce, uh, say, refrigerators, that don't need as much electricity? Or can we uh, produce cars that get more miles per gallon of gas? So in other words, can we make our stuff more efficient? Uh, in which case we reduce the demand for cheap, easy energy. However, even if we make things really efficient, we're still going to have some demand for cheap, easy energy. And so the good news there is that we have a lot of other options. We have solar energy, we have wind energy, hydroelectric, biofuels, all of those could be used uh, as a way of reducing uh, the amount of carbon emissions going into the atmosphere. It's going to be difficult to completely change away from fossil fuels. There's going to be some amount, especially uh, for the next sort of 50 years or so. And so we are going to see some carbon emissions. But can we use technology such as carbon capture and storage to actually capture that CO2, for example, from a power station uh, liquefy it and uh, store it somewhere, perhaps underground. Uh, that's going to be difficult to do at a big, giant societal scale, but maybe in a few places we could use that and that could help us lower our emissions even further. We are seeing still, though, that there are rising carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere. So can we prevent that from having negative impacts on the climate and oceans? So the next step that we could potentially do is have geoengineering. And by that, I mean artificially uh, messing with the climate system, for example, by increasing the amount of reflection from the Earth by having more clouds or uh, more aerosols in the atmosphere. Or can we do things that would help remove carbon from the atmosphere, either artificially by uh, creating some sort of uh, industrial process or by planting trees, for example, which is something that we can and are doing right now that would help remove CO2 from the atmosphere. Uh, however, we are seeing negative impacts from climate change. We are going to continue to see some climate changes into the future, even if we act today. 
And so it's really important that we take what we understand, all of the things that you've learned about in your class, about ecosystems, about ecosystem services, about climate, about uh, natural hazards, and we use that information to come up with plans to adapt to that change, to make sure that it doesn't uh, reduce well-being as much as possible, especially across society, not uh, and, and taking care of the more vulnerable people as well. So hopefully that has given you something to think about in terms of there is lots of things that we can do. And what I want to point out is that this is not just an environmental science problem. This is our entire society going to shift in the next decades. And it's a, tremendous, a tremendously exciting time to be around. Our world is going to look really, really different. Our society is going to look really, really different in the next 30, 40 years. Uh, and the information that you've learned in your AP environmental science class is going to be really relevant for that. No one is going to be able to opt out of that change. And so the more you understand about this, the more you understand the threats, but also the opportunities for society, uh, the better off you'll be, whether you end up in business, in policymaking, running for public office, uh, or as an environmental scientist somewhere acting uh, to help these things. So you're going to carry that information with you uh, for the next decades and use it uh, repeatedly as well. So I hope you really value that opportunity. It's going to serve you very well. So with that, I'll thank you for your attention and I'll wish you the best of luck in your exam in a couple of months.